please give a warm welcome to artist and sculptor Timothy Schmaltz. Thank you. I really feel at home here. Um, I've met so many awesome people and already had quite a bit of conversations about art and the value of art. Um, but so what I'm going to be doing here is kind of giving you uh, an outline of my whole career as a, as a sculptor. And uh, I think with on this journey, you'll kind of uh, hopefully see some of the uh, highlights, the spiritual insight that I had that uh, actually feeds me and, and compels me to give as much as I can with my sculpture. Uh, but before I start flipping through this old photo album of sculptures, um, I would lo love to uh, play a, a video, a short video, just to, if that would be possible. de escultura en bronzo de argilla prefigura un grupo de inmigrantes de varias culturas en diversos periodos históricos. He voluto esta ópera artística aquí en Piazza San Pietro a fin que recorde a todos la sfida evangélica de la acogienza. Lo que esta escultura dice es que las personas han been moving people have been fleeing all throughout human history and we hope that the church will always be in a position to accompany them and as the Holy Father has repeatedly asked of us to welcome them, to protect them, to promote them and to integrate them. Those are the faces and the eyes you can see in the sculpture that the people are looking forward to what is ahead of them. Showing that our Catholic faith today is alive and kicking and that this is not a museum but a living spiritual place. Thank you. Um, I, that's the best video that I've ever seen of any sculpture that I created. It was just awesome. It was created by the Vatican, and it captures, um, I think, uh, one of the most important points or one of the most important periods of my life as a, as a Catholic sculptor. I was warned by the Vatican that uh, for the dedication there was going to be 50,000 people there. And so I better get it there on time. And every, <laughs> everything went perfect. Um, the piece was installed and uh, the sculpture, every day people are seeing that message. But I want to start way back from the beginning about when I actually had an artistic conversion 
with my sculpture. And then I'll hit on uh, talking about a little bit of the Angels Unawares, the, the piece in St. Peter's Square, and then um, I will get into talking about what I'm doing now after, after that historical installation. So you see here, you can see that, yeah, the photos are up. Um, you can see here I'm 21 or 22 years old in my studio in Toronto. And uh, this is um, two years after I dropped out of art school. I was absolutely crushed and disenchanted with what they taught at the school. Um, I only stayed there for three months and then I dropped out. And um, what I found, and it was Ontario College of Art, which is considered the greatest art school in Canada. And I was, I was so delighted to get accepted in. You'd have to show your portfolio. And uh, I was ready for the, I had great expectations that this school is going to uh, make me a sculptor, make me an artist. But what I really quickly found out was that they weren't necessarily interested in the type of artwork that I loved. Uh, they weren't really conditioning me to become the artist that I wanted to be. Instead, what I found was they were mocking the whole idea of artwork by how they chased trendy ideas in the art world. And I felt it was, it was insane. It was, it was not about anything substantial, it was about being the first, being the innovative one, be the one that does something that no one did before. And one of the reasons why I fell in love with artwork is because I loved the great masters. I loved uh, the beauty in the artwork. So when I was confronted with a, a school that was really saying that all that stuff didn't matter and what matters as an artist today is to do something absolutely shocking, do something that has never been done before. I began to uh, feel that this is not really what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I did, I knew I wanted to be an artist at the age of 16, but now I was challenged. I went through this absolute crisis. The, the peak of the time was when I woke up this one day and I had a dream, and I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sculpt this dream. And I don't even remember what the dream was. It was a complex, chaotic dream. And I started to work on it, and I just got this feeling of, well, who are you, Tim? You're the professional dream interpreter of Timothy Schmalls. Is it that important? And I began to realize that, that there was this selfishness in artwork, this, this personality of the artist, like Andy Warhol, like Van Gogh cutting off his ear, that seemed to weigh more in uh, the importance than the actual creative work that was, that was produced. And um, I quit OCA and uh, I started my own studio. And uh, that's the studio that you see right there. And it was a small studio. The first studio I had was 500 square feet um, and I lived, I lived in that downtown Toronto. I slept on a board. I had my business clothes in a little plastic bag, and that was my life. <laughs> and it was it, no plumbing, and it was it was an old factory. In, at that time in Toronto, you would have tons of, of studio spaces just like that, really cheap. I think I paid like 350 bucks a month right downtown Toronto. But at this time, I began to think about the idea of doing Christian artwork. Um, and I began to hate the idea of doing art for art's sake. And so I looked at the, the art that made me love art when I was a 16 year old. And that was Michelangelo, that was Bernini, that was Rodin. So I remember this time what I did, and I was in that studio, and I took some clay, just like I'm working outside, and I did for the first time a crucifixion scene. And I kid you not, I felt completely happy, right deep down inside me. For some reason, it just like, I, I was like as happy as anything, just doing this simple crucifixion. And then I moved to a very simple St. Francis and a very simple Mary. 
And I thought, if I feel this great about doing the sculpture, it must rub off on the clay that goes into the piece. And so at that point in time, I began to realize that I want to be a Christian artist. And I thought, this, is, this has substance. It, it's not art for art's sake. It has a purpose. I'm representing Jesus. And so I went back to looking at the Donatello, the Michelangelo's, and I be, in my little small studio, I began to actually create my own school for me. And my teachers were, were the great masters. And, and it was really interesting because at that time, um, a couple artist friends around me um, actually suggested and mentioned this person. Uh, his name was Father Peter Laracy. He was a Jesuit. Uh, professor at uh, the University of Toronto, Regis College. And I said, oh, you should meet him. He's a really interesting person. You guys would get along. Uh, I met Pot uh, Father Peter Laracy. Immediately, he said, I should be your spiritual director. <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> let's do it. And so what started there was an amazing relationship with a, a, uh, a priest that really influenced me, that encouraged me to become an artist at the age of like 20, 21. Um, and what I loved about, about him was how he, he was a professor of fine art or uh, art history at Regis College, University of Toronto, and he actually saw the connection between spirituality and artwork that my teachers at the, the secular colleges didn't even uh, uh, consider existed. Um, and so it was really interesting throughout those conversations and, uh, and throughout uh, repetition of creating sculptures, I formed and I, I, I kind of forged this, this absolute love for Christian artwork. Let me just go to the next scene here. This is one of my first pieces that I did, and um, it's a cast stone piece. It's a Madonna and child, and this is like I'm 22 years old, 21, and um, what, I, what I remember working on this piece is, is the discovery of, of how the clay can actually change the mood of the piece. There was a period of time when this uh, uh, figure of Mary had her eyes open. And one night, because I lived in my studio, I, I un unwrapped the piece and then I closed the eyes. And it just became such a more beautiful, soft piece. And I'll always remember these first couple pieces I did because I was just so excited about creating them. This piece here was a baptismal font. This is actually the first bronze sculpture I ever created. And um, what it really showed me was how design was important. Um, the church, this is a, a church in Canada, they said, we want the baptismal font to have the symbols of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I said, well, why don't we just use the actual uh, symbols there instead of the text? And so you can see this, one of my first sculptures ever, is using that idea of form to create a beautiful uh, design. Not only a sculpture that has the symbols in, but also is something that's pretty nice to look at and, and kind of flows. And that flow will be seen throughout all my pieces, including one I'm working out here. But it was at this time that I started working that I became uh, pr pretty much probably the most radical sculptor in uh, in uh, Toronto because I found that there was such um, animosity towards Christian artwork that they didn't even consider it artwork. And I thought this is insane. You look at, you look at the great masters, 90% of their stuff was Christian. But there in contemporary times, I was doing the most crazy thing that people wouldn't even consider real artwork or artwork. But at that time, what I did was um, I actually learned a lot about spirituality. And the analogy that I gave uh, Peter Laracy, Father Peter Laracy, was I became, I, I was baptized Catholic. I was, I had a conversion experience when I was 17 years old. And, but I didn't bring it into my life. So when I started doing Christian artwork, I felt I was, I was bringing uh, my faith into my day-to-day -day life. I knew I was a Christian. I had this amazing experience. I, I couldn't deny that. But it was marginal, marginal how much it played in my life. But when I created that first crucifixion, I was celebrating in a sense. And what I said to, to Father Peter Laracy is, I felt like 
uh, someone invited me over to their house for dinner so many times and I never returned the, the favor and requested that they come to my house. And by doing Christian artwork, I was definitely doing that. I was really participating in it. But I was surrounded by, uh, by a, a world that was very secular, especially in, in the, the young art people. And um, I, I really felt I was doing something that was very important. But I realized um, how they perceived it. I realized how most people out there um, consider Christianity something that's, you know, for the elder people or something part of our historical past, hokey, uh, silly, um, naive, and simple. And I did realize how so many people in that mainstream world perceives us Catholics and Christians. And I wanted to fight that with my artwork. So I didn't want to necessarily do cookies and cream. I wanted to learn more about the saints. And I wanted to tr try to penetrate that, that veil of sugar and get into the essence of what it is to be a hardcore Catholic. And I knew that artwork, I felt it, w would be an amazing way to do it. Because I, I, I didn't go to Rome at that point, but I'd see like uh, Michelangelo's Bernini stuff and, and the, the representations of the saints. And I'm like, oh my God. And then I hear about how people talk about Christianity and Catholicism. Mary had a little lamb. And it seemed like there was a big difference between that great artwork and the, the mainstream way people perceive Catholics. And I thought that my artwork could be a way of breaking that, that, that illusion and, and bringing on the real Christianity. And this is a piece I did that uh, during this time, I was 23 when I did it, and it, I was amazed at it. This is called The Quiet Moment, and uh, what it is is uh, a sculpture that is a bullseye in a sense. In the center, you have the Jesus, then you have the Mary, and then you have the, uh, the Joseph. Yeah, it's the nuclear family. It's the essence of it being in Christ with Mary. And you can see how, just like that baptismal font, I'm playing with the drapery. It's not real drapery. It's abstract. It's forms. It's making a, a, a circle, and it's bringing you right into that center. And then I realized that every inch of a sculpture has a purpose if you can utilize it in a way that it enhances the person's experience. And that's what I'm working on outside here. I'm moving the clay a little bit and seeing how it affects me because in a sense, I'm the first taste tester. I'm the first person to experience it. And so I'm kind of playing around with it to see the effect. I did this piece when I was 23 years old and it really was a phenomenal piece. It went everywhere at various sizes. And the greatest spot it went was, was uh, to St. Pope John Paul II. And, and this, at, at my early age there, I was just absolutely amazed to meet uh, such a, a saint. And um, I'll always remember that experience because of uh, I felt when I got closer to him, just like my sculptures sometimes have rings, there was rings of spiritual intensity the closer I got to him. The, the bishops of Canada arranged this, this presentation of my greatest sculpture at the time to Pope John Paul II, and uh, the year before he died, so he couldn't, he couldn't talk. He was, he was in not very good shape, but he blessed the sculpture, and it was an encounter that I never forgot. And apparently, if you see it right above uh, uh, the head of uh, St. Pope John Paul II, you can see another face, and that's uh, Cardinal Harvey. And um, what totally blew me away is I became friends with Cardinal Harvey. He's, he, uh, he's the uh, dean of the uh, uh, St. Uh, Paul's outside the walls, St. Paul's Basilica in Rome. And he installed two of my sculptures just recently at St. Paul's Basilica, and I was having an espresso with him. And I said to him, we were just chatting, and I said, you don't remember the first time we met. And he said, oh yes I do, it was when you presented the Holy Family to Pope John Paul II. And I was like, blown away. And then he said, 
And you know, he really loved that sculpture. He put it in a place that he could see it all the time. And for me, this is a conclusion that happened 20 years <laughs> after the first presentation to Pope John Paul II. I was amazed. Um, but that sculpture, um, what, it, what it taught me is that, because I can't tell you how many people fell in love with it, it taught me the power of artwork and the power of beauty. And, and that was one of the great um, moments of my life where I moved forward and I gave more and more to, uh, um, to my artwork. In fact, I sold so many small miniatures of the piece all around the world, really. Um, and uh, I had a surplus of funds for the first time in my life. I, I was Four years I lived on a board and now I had a surplus of funds. And I remember what I did, and this is important, I decided I earmarked some of this money and I wanted to give it to the poor right away. Um, and so I went to my spiritual advisor, uh, director, Father Peter Laracy, and I have said, I have some money to give to the poor. And he said, well, how much? And I told him the amount. And I remember his response was, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, so where do you want me to give it to, Father? And he said, well, you could give it to the Jesuits in Canada. And then the Jesuits in Canada will give it to the Jesuits working with the poorest of the poor in the middle of Africa. And I thought, God's will, whatever, whatever you want. And so he arranged it that the money would go. And this is um, in the center. I forget what, what country it was that the funds went over. And, um, and I wanted to do that right away so I could know that more of my orientation was and that, that, um, that in the future I will keep that same mentality, that spiritual center of, of giving. And it was very interesting because a couple months later I get this small little letter and I knew it was a, a, from a foreign country, you know, those small ones with many different stamps on and I opened it up and it was from this person, a Jesuit in Africa, in hand, little handwriting on a little piece of paper talking about what he's doing with the funds. And I, forget, I still have the letter, but he was building wells and stuff like that with it. And it was signed by this Jesuit, um, uh, Father Cherney, Michael Cherney. And so I kept that. And, and so it was interesting because a couple months later, he'd give me another letter and then Peter Laracy would say, Father Peter Laracy, well, you know, Michael Cherney, you know, the African Jesuit, he's coming into, uh, into uh, Canada and he'd really like to meet with you. So I met him and I gave him a small little black Madonna and child that I created that he could take back to Africa with him. It was nice. But it was, it was really an amazing time for me because with that piece, the important thing for me was I realized the possibility of artwork. That, that art, Catholic artwork today is relevant as long as it's done in a way that people can appreciate it and people can see it. And that, that's, that was kind of my point where I went into subjects and I looked at them on, in a little different way. I thought, hmm, if I do a sculpture of Madonna and Child, I want it to just look almost like a seashell, so peaceful that you can almost hear the ocean when you take a look at it. And so I created this piece here. And I began to be a little bit angry about the secular world, about how they didn't perceive what I did was real artwork because it was Catholic, right? So I did a couple pieces like this that proved that, uh, yes, I can do it. I just don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the most complex sculpture in Canada, um, secular piece. It's a public monument for Sudbury. There's a thousand miners in that sculpture. And uh, that was a major point in my life where I began to think that in order to even to do artwork, you need courage. And you don't think about that with, with something as simple as art. But I remember, I did this in my studio in Mexico at the time, literally my hands were shaking when I was thinking about doing a project this big and I just started it. But I remember, I thought, isn't that interesting that, that even if you're an artist, you can be afraid of art? And so I did this piece, it was a huge project and I couldn't help but think about my time could be been spent doing something else, but I did it the best I could. But I'll, oftentimes I was thinking, hmm, wouldn't it be amazing if this was a subject 
that was a little bit more powerful. When I did do a public piece, I tried to put spirituality in it. This is a fallen firefighter's memorial I created for um, another city in Canada. And there you have an the, the whole scene is surrounded by angel wings. And I thought that was a beautiful way of adding that little bit of spirituality to it. And so I've done several different pieces. And when I can, I put spirituality in it. But this is what I wanted to do when I did the mining monument. A hundred, I wanted to call this sculpture uh, All Saints. But then when I got into the project, I realized that I'd have to call it Some Saints because there's only 140 of the thousands in there. That's a county in Ireland, really, if you think about it. But on that piece there, what I loved about it was the challenge of researching all of these saints. And it took me nine months to do that sculpture, and I loved it. Um, what I'd do is I'd research each saint and think, okay, your spot in the sculpture is like one minute. What do you want to say? And I would try to get them to do the most symbolic, interesting thing they could uh, within this sculpture here. And um, what I, just a little aside, most of the saints had brutal lives. Most of them had horrific lives. And I oftentimes, when I worked on this piece, thought, how did the term, oh, she's a saintly person, come about when most of them had hardcore, serious, serious lives? And I thought, this is hopefully just the beginning of, of many more sculptures I do of some of these saints in a bigger version. I like working big. And this is a, um, an example of me working on a piece in my studio. Oftentimes, like the model you see out there, you can see a little, uh, well, not so little, uh, crucifixion in the back there. And so you have to, when you're working on a piece, you have to start small and go big, especially when you're this size, because inside that is just not clay like I'm using out there, but there's steel, has to be all structured with, with wire and everything around it. But the challenge of doing, um, doing pieces is not necessarily the size, it's the subject matter and finding the correct subject matter. The rest is more just technical. Like most of the pieces I do, I'll use a model. That model, actually, I've been using for 15 years. His name's Ed. He's an amazing model. And uh, 15 years, more than 15 years I've been using him. He was just at my studio three days ago, actually. And he'll hold a pose, like a crucifixion, for as long as he can. And probably the f after the first five years, I stopped saying, do you need a break? Do you want to take a break? And I just let him go. <laughs> and so oftentimes, it's a competition of, do I get tired of sculpting first, or does he get tired of holding a pose? But his name's Ed, Ed CZ. He's a Polish uh, uh, friend. I consider him a really good friend of mine now. And his, his parents were refugees that came over to Canada. Interesting story. Um, and uh, early in the morning, he always comes to my studio at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, and we'll have these quiet moments of work interspersed with a couple comments. And it's really, it's really beautiful. He has the, the, the temperament to stay still, like unbelievable. It's just fascinating. But so when I get to a certain spot, I'll use models. I'll use Ed, and, uh, and I'll work and get that anatomy uh, just a little bit more enhanced as I'm working. There's a finished piece in carved in wood. I don't carve in wood very much anymore because it just, it's just such a technical process. In fact, uh, the last life-size wood sculpture I did, I counted uh, maybe five life-size sculptures. If I didn't carve it in wood, stone's worse. And uh, I'm not going to talk about that. That's... But what I'm interested in is the representation of, of, of stories and making them accessible to people. This is, um, this is an African uh, crucifixion I did for Tanzania. And um, I did another African uh, corpus uh, for uh, Cardinal Gregory in Washington when he was in Atlanta, when he was Archbishop Gregory. And it was fascinating because that's at the uh, Archdiocese of Atlanta. And it was a wonderful thing to actually in a, uh, a city like uh, Georgia where I'd say probably around 70% of the people are uh, in Atlanta. I mean, 70% are African-American to have a, a Christ that's African. Oftentimes I think uh, being a Germanic uh, uh, white person, a lot of the artwork fits 
I can imagine the people, but if I was an Asian and I walked into a church and everyone was uh, one race, I don't necessarily think it would be a connection to me. And so that's why I'm very sensitive whenever I do a, a representation of Jesus. How it, what, what's the face of Jesus look like today? I know how it looked in the Renaissance when in Europe most of the people were, looked relatively the same. Now it's a lot more challenging, I think, to, to use sculpture to uh, people that it reaches out to them. So oftentimes what I'll do is, I'll, if the opportunity allows, I will do uh, an African or um, an Asian representation just to mix it up a bit, right? Fascinating, this went to Tanzania and uh, they said that it's a, a Capuchin shrine, massive Capuchin shrine in, in Tanzania. And they said, you know what? We have a hard time finding African Jesus in Africa, in Tanzania. And I thought, oh, that's, that's very uh, sad in a sense, right? And that comes to, oftentimes what I say is one of the best faces, one of the best portraits of Jesus I created uh, was, the, um, was a sculpture that has no face. And it was interesting because this is the homeless Jesus, and uh, it's basically the flagship sculpture on the series of Matthew 25 that I've been working on for, uh, I think it was a seven-year project. Um, and um, initially when I had the piece, the, the exploration of it went, was amazing. I was working on the clay in my studio, and I didn't have the face completely covered. And then I covered it up and it just, it just spoke to me. And um, the sculpture really moved me working on it. And I was ta talking to some of the people here because uh, when I was working on it, I was very close to the, the, the sculpture. In fact, I remember this one time I was working on it and I was close to the feet and I thought, this is the closest I ever got to a homeless person working on this. And I thought, well, it's not even a real person. It's a sculpture of a homeless person. And I was really conscious about how there's that force field, there's that, that invisible barrier between us and the marginalized. And so when I worked on it, as you can see here, I left some space so other people could sit like I was when I was actually sculpting the piece. And it was interesting because the the inspiration of the sculpture came from one trip I had in Toronto. I was in the center of Toronto. It was November in the middle of the day and there was a homeless person that was completely shrouded with a blanket. And instantly I said to myself, that's Jesus. And I was shaken. I, if you're like me in the country and you go into the center of a big city, you're shaken to begin with. But when I saw that, it just moved me, and I thought, that's Jesus. And I don't know if it was a male or a female, it was just this human form. And I think that the thing that really, really hit me was, it was in the middle of the day on one of the busiest streets, and it was like, I believe that I was the only one seeing that person. And that, to me, I felt was Jesus. And so I went back to my, my studio in the idyllic small town of St. Jacob's, and I couldn't get that out of my mind. And I thought, well, why don't I sculpt that so maybe other people can, can experience that. And I, yeah, I did move out of the downtown, my, my small studio, and I got a, a nice uh, place in the country. And so I thought, I'm at an advantage because I'm outside of the city and I only go in every you know, couple times a year so I can see that, I can see the city, I can see the, those people, they are real people to me. And I don't blame the people that live in the city that eventually it becomes blurrier and blurrier and blurrier till that lump is just another obstacle in the city and there's no soul, there's nothing underneath it. And I thought if I can create my Matthew 25 sculptures and put them out there, perhaps people will see again. And it's interesting because one of my favorite quotes that really kind of summarizes up um, my ideas of artwork is um, by Oscar Wilde. He's uh, a playwright, previous century. Um, he wrote this book or an essay called Decay of Line, and it's all about the power of artwork. And he, sa he, he basically states that the people in London didn't see the fog till the painters started painting it. And I thought, that's the magic. That is the power of artwork. 
And if you think about it, sculpture is even more than painting because it's there, it's solid, and it, make, it, it draws people's attention to it. And oftentimes we look at sculpture as, you know, the famous politician, the famous athlete, and it's almost the highest way we can give a compliment to someone. You can give them an honorary degree, but if you make a statue of them, put them in a park, that's serious, that's the highest. So if we take the least in our community and create statues of them, and I think it's because of our, our for thousands of years, this, this, the statues have been so important in our culture that people look at it. That's why when someone does a piece of artwork, um, it automatically brings it up, uh, the, the awareness brings it up to a, a level that it wasn't there before. And so if we can use, if I can use that to bring attention to, to the least, the people that are not even seen, let alone have artwork created, it could become a real force in a community, in a culture. And so these are some of the ideas that I had when I was in my studio creating the small model of creating this piece so other people can actually see the homeless people, like really see them. Now I wanted to make sure that it would be a piece that would be approachable to many different people. And that's one of the techniques about con making sure that the head is and the face is not very visible. But I did pull up the, the blanket a bit so you could see the feet. So you see the wounds in the feet. And the cool thing about that is it's very consistent to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, there is that eureka moment. There is that ambiguity at first of what's being talked about, and then slowly it comes on that it's Jesus. And so just like that, a lot of people come up to the sculptures, all my Matthew 25 pieces, and have one idea of what it is, but then when they get closer with further investigation, almost like theater, they have the real meaning that's behind it. And so this sculpture here, ironically, because I pride myself in spending so much time sculpting in my studio, the inspiration for this came outside of my studio on the streets. And I thought, isn't that interesting? And the sculpture, little did I know, because the first piece I created, I couldn't find a place to install it. And I literally said, the homeless Jesus has no home. I said that <laughs> because I had a patron to pay for the first one and I couldn't find any person that would want it. Actually, the Archdiocese of Toronto suggested they could have it, but then something, it fell through. I had no place for it. And I took the money from the patron. I needed to find a place for it. It took me a year, it sat in a crate. And actually, it was my uh, spiritual director, Peter Laracy, that helped find the location for it. And I thought, this is now a spiritual problem. I have to go to him. So he took one look at it. He reached out to Regis College, the college that he taught at. And it went from one year sitting with a dust collecting on the, on the crate to how quickly can we get it here. And when it was there, then it exploded around the world. It was just absolutely awesome to see it. I had people from, from all over uh, wanting to have a, a, a cast of the piece. There's a piece in Glasgow. And it's really cool about the sculptures is that you can place them at an area where mm, you might not really expect a sculpture to be found. Not on a huge pedestal, but where you'd find a park bench, where you'd find a homeless person. This is probably the greatest photo I got. When the sculpture went to Johannesburg, they had a party for it. And they actually <laughs> made a cake for the homeless Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that nice? And, but I think one of the most special places in Capernaum, at the entrance of Capernaum in the Holy Land, they placed the sculpture there. And um, so it was really fascinating. This is uh, Archbishop Fizzicelli, Fizzi Fizzi um, the uh, president of New Evangelizing for the uh, Vatican. And uh, he's been promoting my artwork ever since he saw some of my first pieces. And uh, so there's a variety of different photos of the piece and that's in, um, uh, that's the most gothic photo ever you could imagine. That's St. John the Divine Cathedral in November and I took that photo, a woman in the rain looking at the homeless Jesus. But this is, a, uh, this is in Washington, D.C., and uh, this wasn't taken when I was down there, but one of the fascinating things was when Pope Francis came to America, 
I was asked to go to the sculpture and talk about it because they, the NBC, I believe it was, uh, believed that this sculpture summarized the spirit of, of Pope Francis, so they wanted me to talk about the piece. So I went down there on G Street in Washington, D.C. They have all this camera stuff and everything like this. This is right near the Catholic Charities in Washington. And all of a sudden, uh, three of these black homeless guys, that's not one of them, these guys were taller, I think, <laughs> they came up and they were like, what are you doing with our sculpture? <laughs> and then they began to talk about how much that piece means to them. And that, to me, was one of the most amazing moments of my life being a sculptor. And it's interesting because when I first thought about this, this is, this is for, for us homeowners to think about, you know, to see, the, to, to see Christ in, in the least. But no, what I realized it's for the least to see themselves as sacred as well. And so that, it's an amazing photo. I just got this off of the, uh, off of the internet. But yeah, so what I've, what I've done was I've created uh, a variety of different representations to symbolize Matthew 25. I took each fragment and I made a sculpture of it. And they're in some of the most wonderful places that you could imagine. After this series, I was, uh, this is my favorite St. Padre Pio. That's it, the old St. Patrick's Church. I don't have time to talk about that piece, but P Padre Pio is amazing. Um, and this sculpture is installed in many different spots. But after, the, uh, after my, my sculptures of Matthew 25 went all over uh, the world, I was uh, requested by the Vatican when a new department of uh, migrants and refugees started up to actually do a sculpture um, to celebrate uh, the migrants and refugees and, and to promote them and to kind of show their story. And this is where things are really, really spiritual for me. Um, the undersecretary to Pope Francis that works directly on the migrants and refugees department happens to be Cardinal Cherney who I met decades ago when he was in the field in the middle of Africa trying to help people. And I, with my piddly little bit of money, tried to help him help people. There we are in Rome discussing a new sculpture for the Vatican. And <laughs> it was one of the most fascinating periods of my time because as I sculpt, I listen to the Bible. I've been listening to the Bible nonstop, obsessively, almost like a mad person uh, for years. Every time I go in my studio, I turn on um, a repeated disc. I change the disc every day. It's part of my ritual. And, uh, and that's how I start my day. And then it's on repeat the whole day, more than eight hours. And what I wanted to do then was I wanted to saturate my studio in this in, in, in scripture, I wanted, I thought, what, what benefit am I to listen to the, to the radio or the news or, or classical music? That's not benefiting me. That's not going to help me very much. And so I thought I'd brainwash myself by listening to the Bible nonstop. <laughs> I'm just kidding about brainwashing. Brainwashing if I listen to the news nonstop. But what's fascinating about that, and I have the luxury of doing that because I'm, I'm in my studio like 12 hours a day, so I, I can control what, what goes in my ears. And um, amazing things happen if it's on repeat. And one thing that happened to me is Hebrews 13, 2, be welcoming to strangers, many have entertained angels unawares. I must have listened to that hundreds of times, but there's this one time it just penetrated me right to my heart. And I thought, be welcoming to strangers, many have entertained angels unawares. And I just had this absolute desire to create a sculpture that would celebrate that scripture, but I didn't know what it was. Until a year later, Cardinal Cherney asked me to do a sculpture of refugees. I get back to my studio, the whole idea just collapses right into my heart. I know exactly how it will look. It's a huge boat with migrants and refugees from all historical periods, from all times in history, on one raft, that's me sculpting it, 
with an angel in the center. But because of the crowd, you can only see the wings. So in a sense, the wings become everyone's wings. And so I created this piece, and it was one of the most amazing sculpture projects possible. Let's give Tim a round of applause and invite Gene Beal to come up and lead us in his discussion. So what's next for you? What are you working on now? I am working on uh, an amazing, most challenging piece, and that's it right there. Oh, on the theme of human trafficking. After I created the, the uh, Angels Unawares, Cardinal Cherney in the Vatican asked me to spend my time on another subject that's close to Pope Francis's heart, and that is human trafficking. Another 20-foot sculpture, this time St. Paquita, the patron saint of uh, human traffic, is essentially letting the oppressed go free, which is the title of it. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Can, can you talk a little bit about the statue you created for um, Pope Francis' visit to Canada? Mary, the untire of knots? I wish I had a photo of it, <laughs> but it is, Pope Francis has a great devotion to um, uh, Mary, Untire of the Knots, which is actually a Baroque painting that he came across in Germany that shows Mary untying knots. This is something that is so attached to Pope Francis, and it's so important for our time because we are, the world, we have a lot of problems in it. The idea of creating um, a piece that celebrates Pope Francis's devotion was totally, totally in my heart when I created Mary Untire of the Knot. So I have Mary Untie Knots. What I added though was the world at the feet of Mary. And so when Pope Francis historically came to Canada, uh, the Vatican uh, was shown a picture of this. Pope Francis saw the new sculpture I created and he said he wants to give this to the indigenous people of Canada. Oh, cool. And so now it's, uh, permanent, it's gonna be permanently installed at uh, Lac Saint Anne, one of the places that he visited, which is a very popular place, um, a pilgrim place for indigenous Catholics. So it's, it's really exciting. Cool. So you, you've said that since you're talking about installation, sacred artwork is best viewed in living spaces. Can you talk about what that means to you and why it's important that your art be installed outside? I think today a lot of people are intimidated on going into churches. Um, and, uh, you know, you have after COVID too, you have uh, a drop in the people going, going in t inside the churches. And I thought to have a sculpture that's evangelizing to the people that are afraid or, 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 or not not caring to go inside the church almost becomes the face of the faith that we can put across and show people um, what's inside that church. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, that is almost like the visual ambassador that has to, I believe, make a statement that tells people what's inside. And so it's almost like the introduction um, and I think that, in, you know, the beautiful architecture does that in a lot of the beautiful churches in Europe and, and in North America. However, it can be a little bit intimidating, and it, and, it, and it doesn't, a lot of that beauty does not really penetrate what we are about as Catholics. But if I can, if I can craft a sculpture, create a sculpture that kind of shows that purity, that hardcore essence of it, then, then, then that's a, a great ambassador to have outside. All right. Um, and it seems for you that installation location is almost as important as the subject itself. If you could place a sculpture anywhere in the world for people to witness, where, where would it be? I would say that oftentimes I think that in a place, a big city, mm -hmm. um, where people don't have the the, the time to actually uh, read the Gospels. And, but if I could give a little part of that Gospel out in that 
on that street, on that city church, in front of the, that cathedral, that they, they pass by and they, they, with their eyes, then read the gospel. That's, that's I, I think, uh, a, wonderful, a wonderful spot for it. I also love the idea of, of um, the pieces in Rome, too. And oftentimes, years before I had any sculptures in Rome, I thought that it's, the, the, the artwork there has another message that, and I said this in that, that short little video, that, that um, our faith is something that belongs in a museum. And when you're there in Rome, it's like, oh my God, it is a museum. But <laughs> the distorted impression that the artists that created that never intended was that we're old, we're really old, we're from another place. And that's why I was so, I'm so happy that I have new sculptures going into the eternal city um, to show that there's uh, almost like, I love, love using this analogy, almost like a homily. You can have an amazing homily from a priest in the 1920s. I know you can find it in books of grand homilies from the 19th century, right, or whatever. Um, but a priest doesn't pull that out you know, oh, this is a good one from 1820. I'm going to use this today at my, at my uh, mass, right? The, the, the priest is an artist as well, and he crafts a homily to address today. Mm -hmm. And artwork has to do the same. Oftentimes, artwork, Catholic artwork, does not do that because it's taken, pulled from another century, pulled from, from decades ago. Um, uh, a priest wouldn't think of doing that on his homily, but why are we doing that with our visual artwork? And so that's why I love to, to have pieces that are in historical places too. So it, it, it makes a statement of rejuvenation in a sense as well, right? Mm -hmm. So one more. Yeah. You've called yourself an artistic soldier for Pope Francis. What do you mean by that? I, ideally, I want, I want to kind of disappear in the artwork. Um, and so, um, if I can take scripture or, uh, uh, and uh, the values that the eternal truths of Catholicism and present them in a way that is so authentic, I will disappear and it will just be that direct link. Um, and that's, again, going back to my, my early 20s, art for art's sake, it has to, it, it, it's, it's an incestual thing there. Art is meant to have its roots in something that is beautiful on its own, eternal on its own. And that's what, the, that's what uh, Christianity is in a sense. And so when, I'm, when I was working on the human trafficking piece, they asked me to do it and I'm gonna give everything I can to make it the best. The, the uh, refugee piece, likewise. I was actually working on that piece and I was working on uh, the front three figures. There's a Hasidic Jew, there's a Polish woman, and uh, there's a Muslim. The Muslim is shoulder to shoulder with the Jew. The Jew, what I, I mean, the Muslim, what I decided to do was to put the head, uh, the headdress on. And this is at a time in Quebec, in Canada, where they're actually trying to ban that. Mm. And I thought, oh, this is really risky. A lot of people are gonna be pissed off at this. And I thought, well, because they're at the front too, right? Mm. And I thought, well, what would Pope Francis want? And I thought, Pope Francis would want me to cover up everything but the eyes. And so all the time when I was working on that, that's, that's what I was thinking is, what would he want, he right? Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, that's I think, the powerful thing about artwork is, and I do believe this, that, that if it was perfectly done, it could convert people. Mm. And if it's not perfectly done, that's my own human error and human weakness. Almost like Michelangelo said that uh, he could see the sculpture inside the stone and all he had to do is chip away what wasn't the, the actual figure. Well, I don't do stone, but I got a better analogy. I believe that the perfect sculptures are in this platonic sphere in heaven, mm -hmm. and all, it, all I need to do is really pray and do a lot of hard work, and I can pull them down. And if I pull them down accurately enough, these platonic paradise representations are so awesome that people will convert. Mm. And uh, I had an experience where actually at St. Matthew's Cathedral in, uh, in Washington, D.C., 
where Christ the Naked is now installed outside. At that blessing, a young man, 25, came up to me and he said, I converted to Catholicism because of your homeless Jesus. Wow. And I thought, excellent. <laughs> what a mission. <laughs> but when... <laughs> Thanks. Great. Yeah, and, and, and the surprises of, of the pieces too, like, like uh, in Washington, D.C., running into those homeless people. I do. I've had, uh, I've had experiences that, that make me realize that, that people, if they are presented the Gospels in a way that they can, they can digest, um, they, will, they will love it. They'll buy in. Yeah, yeah. And so that's my mission. No. Thanks so much. Thanks for sharing with Thank us. You. Thanks. Thank you. Tim, thank you. And before you go, can you give us some insight into the piece you're making here with us and what you're pulling down into that, uh, into that work? Uh, there it is. <laughs> this is. This is a fascinating, uh, wonderful break from my uh, huge projects I'm doing in my studio in Canada. And uh, the, the sculpture here is something that I have been thinking about doing. I have a library of unfinished sculptures and, and ideas in my, in my head. And, and this, this time here, the opportunity is to take the idea of the homeless and Jesus and represent it in a way that almost combines the intimacy of my homeless, I mean, uh, of my my uh, ho uh, holy family that St. Pope John Paul II blessed, um, that warm embrace to bring that uh, with Jesus and a homeless person. And so that, that's the real inspiration for this. And I, I do that because of my sculptures. I can borrow ideas from one and then merge them and to create a new piece completely. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks.